welcome to today's session on the basics of Google Classroom. Um, my name is Rachel and I'm from Arc ICT Solutions. What we are going to do today is take you on a quick tour of how to use Google Classroom, what it looks like, set up and um, set in some work basically for the primary classroom. Now I do apologise, we're going to make this session last about 45 minutes to an hour because I know what teachers are like with time. Um, being that it's very little. Uh, so it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. But what I just wanted to point out is after this live session, the link that you've clicked on to get on here today remains available. So you can go and play back the session. We also will upload uh, this video to our Arc ICT YouTube page. So if you give us a search on YouTube for Arc ICT Solutions, you'll find something like this. And we also do some other short snippet videos on there as well. So um, what I am going to do it is going to be a basic introduction today where we're going to delve into lots of things but quite briefly but if you do need to look back on them at a later date then please feel free so if you haven't joined a live teams event before um, what you will find your webcam is off and things like that you don't need to worry but on the right hand side you will have a Q&A box um, so please feel free to post in there where you're from what school you're from say hello because although I am doing the presenting today it is not just me uh, behind the scenes we've got some of the other guys who are going to be answering your questions live so if there's something i'm saying that you're not quite sure about or if you have a question about anything else with google classroom doesn't matter how little or how silly you think please do pop it in there one of the team will be able to see it and they'll respond to you live so they will pick up those questions and they will answer them for you today okay now what i am going to do now is i'm going to get my screen all sorted and share this over for you um and that should be coming live. So what you'll see first of all is if you've joined us today, then more than likely you've joined us as part of the DFE funding for this remote platforms that's been set up and that's been that's been going in light of uh, the way in which we've been working more recently. So if you have joined us as part of the DFE funding, your classroom should already be set up, your pupils should be on, everything should be done, and this, as part of a handover, you should be accessing this training. Now, if you are, what we will have done is we'll have set you up with a site like this, and this is just a Google site just with some links on. I just wanted to point out at the beginning so this is our demo one here that it's really worth having a look at it um, like I say today is going to be a starting point as a, as a whistle stop tour of what you can do you'll find a load more links on here with regards to Google Classroom Google Drive Google Meets um, there are training links there are loads of real good things on here so what I'm just trying to point out before I start is that after today you're not on your own if you are an ARC funded school if you're with us anyway then please feel free to get in touch at education at arc.me.uk and ask us any questions that arise um, but you're not on your own go to google there are loads of good resources so we've just tried to link a few of them here so let's open up our google classroom so you can kind of see what we're doing today so if you type in classroom.google.com, you will get to a page which looks like this or similar to this, because this is mine. Um, what is worth saying is Google Classroom is a browser based platform. And to be fair, all of the Google suite is so it can be accessed on a phone, on a laptop, on a tablet, things like that. If you do have iPads or tablets, you can download the suite as well. So you can download Google Docs and Google Classroom as individual apps if you want to. You don't have to because they will all work through the browser. So when I type in that, this is what I'm shown with and it has my classrooms that I've got here. So if you've been set up with DFE funding, you'll find that your classrooms will already be tied in and you should be linked to them already. You don't have to do anything. OK, a couple of things I want to talk from this homepage before we go into the classroom. If you log on and you suddenly see that there are no classes, what a lot of children are doing, which we've been sending them home with their logins, you may need to look on this right hand side to your account. OK, and this is worth pointing out kind of in the school to your children as well. If you're expecting pupils to use this platform at home, they'll probably go to classroom.google.com and they'll find that there's no classrooms. Now, that doesn't mean that something's gone wrong. Nine times out of ten, what it means is that they're linked with their parents account. So lots of parents will sync their Google accounts just to store their Internet history and their data. Like I've got here some different accounts they may just need to toggle between the two okay you as teachers might need to do this as well if you've got personal accounts so with your pupils just make sure that if they can't see it go over to the right hand side and make sure they're on the right account uh, whilst I'm over here the other thing that I may recommend and it's up to you if you want to do it is you can go to manage your Google account and you can change your display name. So mine used to say Rachel Vidler. I just logged on and changed my first name to Miss because I just thought for professionalism in the classroom, I quite liked having it as Miss Vidler. So on the right hand side, that's, that's where you need to head. If you don't see your classrooms, make sure you're logged on to the same, the right account. 
One more thing with regards to settings before I go in. Uh, on the left hand side, you have your main menu here. This is just things with your G Suite, like your calendar and your classes. It's also got archive classes, which is quite nice. So if you have been using this historically and you've got ones from the year before that you still want to drop into and look at some of your maybe like uh, model pieces of work from what you did last year, you can still access them there. But at the bottom, you've got settings. Now this settings will take you to this page where you can change your profile picture if you want to, but more importantly, it's where you'll find all your notification settings. So if you start to use Google Classroom quite well in your school, you're going to find that you're going to get a lot of emails coming through as and when children do something with the platform. So you may want to turn your notifications off here. One thing I'm going to mention, and I will come back to this a little bit later with regards to comments. Personally, I like to leave mine on and I will explain why a little bit later, but that's your choice. You can turn them off here and right down at the bottom. You've got class notifications. Now, as you saw briefly at the beginning, and I'll take you back there in a minute, I had more than one classroom associated. And the reason we've done that on our demo account is we're kind of anticipating that it's a two form entry school. If you work in a two form entry school or a three form entry school, it is really worth being associated with other classes in your year group. And I'll show you how to do that and I'll talk about why to do that a little bit later. But I'm associated with Joe, the other year five demo class. I do not want notifications when his kids are doing stuff. So right down at the bottom, you can quite easily turn off classes. It's really nice if you've got a member of SLT, say your maths and English lead, who are members of all classes. So when they're doing book scrutiny, they can really quickly go and look across classrooms. Or certainly a computer lead, they might want to see what you're doing. Um, but you don't want the notifications. Head over to here and turn them off. So. I'm going to take back to googleclassroom.com one more time and what I can guarantee it's going to do is kick me out of my demo account because yep it syncs with my other ones so remember if you don't see any classrooms like I've got here just make sure you're in the right account I'm just going to switch back to this one so on this platform we've got two demo ones um, you should be associated like I said if you took up the funding with your classes already if you're not doing the funding and you've joined us some other way um, please you can press the plus button this is how you're going to add classes okay so add or join your two options join is going to be for your pupils to kind of get into their class and then obviously you can create a class there and it's very simple to create a class i'm not going to talk that through today but you'll probably find that on our youtube channel um i say just point out that create a class because one of the downsides with google classroom in my opinion is that you can't group children very nicely so you can't make intervention groups you can't make ability groups quite easily what you do have the option to do though is make unlimited classrooms. So if you've got a group of six or seven children that are constantly going out for interventions and you want a record of what they're doing so they can set tasks on there, there's no reason you can't set up an extra class. We also have schools that <clears throat> like to set up classes per term. So they have an autumn class, a spring term, a class, a summer class. So it doesn't get overly populated. You've got that option as well. So if you want to set up more than one class, you can. But this is my main classroom that we're going to go into. So click on my Miss Fiddler class and you get the stream page. OK, now this is just like your home page. It's a bit like a social media holding page, like your news feed, and it's all chronological order of anything that's been posted to the stream. And as you can see here, I've had a little bit of a tidy up, so it's not too busy, but this is why some schools go for more than one class, because as you can imagine, using this all year and if you use it quite a lot, it's going to get quite full up. OK, now just a bit of a navigation around this page. Quite like it. As a teacher, you haven't really got to do a lot. So if you've logged on here, you've got your banner at the top where you can select your theme or upload a photo. So you can personalise it. You have the option for this drop down message. So you could maybe say what we're focusing on this term if you wanted to. And then on the top here, you only have two things to worry about. So your meet link, I'm going to come back to right at the end. And then you also have class code. If I grab up your class code, what your class code is, it's a really useful way to ensure you get all of your children onto the platform. So like I say, if you've taken up the DfE funding that's out there at the moment, you do not have to worry about this at all. As part of the DfE funding, you get a free subscription to WAND. Now, what WAND is, is it's a platform that links together all of our external logins and as such. So WAND links with your MIS. So if you've got Scholar Pack or uh, Target Tracker or Sims, it will pull in all of your child's data, all of your people's data from what classes they're in, and it pushes them out onto here so it's all done for you if you're not using that um, or next year if you don't want to pay that subscription your class code is what you're going to want so when i used to use this in my classroom i'd take all of the children down to the ict suite the first time we were logging on i put this class code up really big on the board the children then press that plus they go join class and it says put in a class code they enter this once and then they're linked with this class so they don't have to do that again forevermore they're just linked unless you choose to remove them from the class so it's a really nice way again your admin you could individually add 35 children to a class 
else but i don't want to do the legwork when the children can all just type in that that code and be joined themselves so it's quite nice that stays on your banner if you get a new starter throughout the year you know where to find it you can just go here's your class code and they can go in um i'm going to talk through settings on the classroom page one more thing to think about so again most of this is set up at an admin level so you don't have to do anything as a teacher and you don't have to worry there's just one thing i want to point out on here so if you go into your settings you've got class details your description which is where you can add that drop down message if you want you can put section room subject <clears throat> the reason that's there is classrooms was originally more like a secondary based platform which is why you've got that not so much needed in the primary school one thing to be aware of just mentioning that is that in my opinion i would use google classrooms as a platform in key stage two i think it's good to use a learning platform like this because they're going to be exposed to certainly some kind of learning platform when they go to secondary school so it's going to be good to get them situated in that kind of things that they're going to be exposed to i wouldn't necessarily use it at key stage one i'd use something like seesaw or dojo as an option there's no reason you can't i'm not saying don't but when the children come to log on they go to classroom.google.com, which you could have a shortcut on your desktop, but they have to put in their username, which is normally an email format for them to log in. So in order to get onto Classroom, you have to have a username at a domain name. So it starts to look like an email address. And for all accounts, it is an email address, but we can just deactivate emails. But they need that long address to log on and then they need a password. So just thinking with my teacher head on, asking year one and two to manipulate around that kind of system going to have some barriers so i would use this from year three upwards personally but anyway scrolling down onto the settings there's two things here there's grading i wouldn't worry about that at the moment i'm not going to touch that in this session it'll be something we'll look at in the future again it's more secondary based application i would have said than what i'd use in a primary school so then you've just got your general settings and you can reset your class code so for whatever reason that got out in there in the realms of social media and you needed to reset it you could but this is the one that you really want to look at it's your stream and on here you have a three tier option of what you want pupils to be allowed to do okay so you've got students can post and comment students can only comment or only teachers can post and comment um, now what you'll find is when you first do this it'll be on the top level so it's going to allow students to post and comment and this is why i wanted to highlight it because it may be something you want to turn off and i'll explain what they mean so when we talk about a post when I come off the settings, I'll show you in a minute, but that basically means you're allowing the children to post anything live to that stream, which gets shared with anyone that is associated with that class. And by post, it means they can send a photo, a video, a link, a YouTube video. They can send just about anything out there. And the key thing to point out here is it goes out live without moderation. So it doesn't go through the teacher's eyes, okay? Which is where those notifications come into it because you may want the notifications on. Now, there's certainly space for that in the primary classroom or using this as a platform. If children are doing extended learning at home, if they're making explanation videos, if they've got work they want to share, then great. You might want to allow them to post. But you know your children, you know their digital literacy skills, you know whether they're ready for that now. OK, I think it's something that you have to train your children in the expectation of this platform and what you want them to post. And then it might be something you can turn on. OK, but we do have some schools who turn it on for a day. If children have done a load of work on the iPads and made a stop motion animation, they might turn it on for an hour, say post it and then turn it off. Uh, some turn it on at weekends. It's up to you where you want to go with that. The second tier is only students can comment. Now, I quite like this as an option because without the commenting, it is literally just a two way platform between teacher and pupil. And I don't see there's any point in that. You want some collaboration. You want some opportunity for them to see that it is a platform that the whole class are using. So allow them to comment. The way in which they comment is they can just comment on posts or announcement that you've already done. OK, so they can't just start their own channel of let's talk about Fortnite. It's going to be on something that you've already posted. And this is where, in my opinion, the notifications for comments I would leave on because what you will get depending on how smart your children are is some children will scroll back to a post from four months ago and they'll start having a conversation with their mates on there you would be none the wiser that that is going on because it doesn't go through moderation but by keeping the email notifications on you can see when children are commenting on stuff so in my opinion I leave it on but that's up to you and then lastly if you don't want any of that you can turn it all off and only teachers can post and comment okay so I'm going to show you what a post looks like. If I take you back to this stream, this is the box that you have when it is turned on. So as a teacher, I have the option to post an announcement. I kind of see it like an announcement and I can send this to my class or I can send it to any class that I'm associated with. So this is where it's really good. If you've got two form three from entry school, you can send one announcement really quickly across several classes. 
one thing I will say with this is some schools then start to use it as like a PTA flyers or announcements like don't forget your swimming kit. Please don't use it as an alternative to systems like parent mail unless you've got 100% connectivity to this platform. Don't forget that you're not going to have some children access it. So don't use it as a sole thing, but it is a good way to send out announcements. If I was doing that for argument's sake and send it to both classes, you'll see that the option to pick students has now been disabled because I'm doing it across classes. I can just send an announcement to a handful of people. So if I don't want everyone to see it, I could just click a couple and only it would go to those pupils. And where I wanted to point out that if again, if you leave this on for pupils, they'll have the exact same level because they can add anything. So on here, I could send a link. I could send a link to some topic work that we're doing. I could send a file out, a video of me explaining, explaining something, a picture, a YouTube video. You can send that all on here and you can post it and it goes live. OK, so like I said, if I scroll down a little bit here, here was just a picture that's uploaded. Here was a link to Times Table Rockstars and here's just a bit of an announcement. So you can send different stuff on here. Now, what I'm going to do really quickly today, I'm going to flick between a pupil view and a teacher view because I think it's quite nice for you to see the uh, the way in which pupils are going to access this as well, just to get a bit of an idea. So this is me on a demo child account and I've just put in classroom.google.com again. Now you'll see that I only have one classroom associated with this. So I've just got my Miss Fiddler class, so I'm going to go into here. And what's quite nice is the pupil sees a very similar view to the teacher, so it's not completely alien for them. OK. The difference here on my stream is that I don't have a post box. There's no way that I can post or send any work in at the top. That's disappeared because we've disabled it. Well, you will see here, though, on this post that's gone live, I can post a comment back and that goes straight out there. Remember, no modification, no um, approval. And it goes straight out there to everyone in the class. OK, so it's on that class comment. So it's just something to think about. Now, let's go back to my teacher view for a second. Um, my teacher view, you'll see that that has gone on there, hasn't gone through my eyes. But one thing I do want to point out is that at the end of it, you've got three dots. It gives you the option to delete it. So if it is something inappropriate, you can take it off, screenshot it, have a conversation with a child. And also it does give me the option to mute. So with regards to comment and posting, you can mute specific children. So if you want to allow it for your class, but there's a few that are ruining it, you can mute them, have those conversations and then unmute them. OK, so. And that's your stream. Now you'll see there's a few other options at the top. I'm going to talk you through each of these. I'm going to come back to classwork last because that's going to be where we're going to spend most of this session, kind of showing you how to actually set work for your pupils. The other options that you've got are people. Um, with regards to people, people here, this is where you can add students or teachers. So you can press this plus button, you can search a student through their name or their email, and you can add them manually that way. This is how you can set up your classroom at the start. But like I say, I wouldn't. I'd use that class code because it's going to save me a lot of time as a teacher rather than manually adding 35 pupils. Uh, on the students, there's only a couple of options. Invite guardians. I don't know that I'd use it massively. It's not like platforms like Seesaw where they see the work. They just kind of get a notification that they've got some work to complete. So again, it's more secondary based, really. And at the end, you've got the three dots and you've got the option to email. Now, if we've set up a DfE platform, we turn this off as standard. It's in the DfE guidance. I think that's good because otherwise pupils could email each other. If you're setting this up, up off your own back, it's worth looking into that and making sure that on your admin level, you've got those restrictions in place. But you do have the option to turn it on. So if in key stage two you were doing a communication unit and you wanted email, you could turn it on for a term if you wanted to. Um, at the top then you have the same kind of tier for teachers. So you can start typing in their name and you can add teachers. Like I say, it is really worth making sure two from entry, three from entry, put on all the same year group teachers. I'll show you why later. It's going to save you a load of time. But again, you can have your SLT, you can have your Senko, you can have your TA, you can have your subject leaders on here if you want to. You can have them all associated should you feel like you want to. The last option at the top then is this grades. Again, this is more secondary based and I don't know that I would use grading that much at a primary level. However, what I do like is you get this nice quick overview of here's my task and there isn't a due date. But if it was homework, I might give it a due date. Uh, who it's been set to, so this has been set to everyone who hasn't done it and who has. So if you are setting homework remotely, it's quite a nice way to pull this up on the board, have an overview, go who's done it, who hasn't done it, okay, why have you done it elsewhere, can I tick it off? So it's a really nice way just to see really quickly what work has been done, who's accessing the platform, who's not accessing the platform, just as an overview. Right. The last one is classwork then, and this is where I'm going to spend the remainder of this session pretty much showing you what you can do with the platform. So when you click on classwork, this is the view that you get. And yours is going to look a lot different because it won't be populated yet. 
Now, what you'll see down the left hand side is I have got topics here. This is really, really, really important, in my opinion, to be able to click on these different topics and see the work that is associated into each of these. OK, I would use topics massively. If you don't, what you start to get is all of this work up here, which is just a muddle. OK, it kind of goes in chronological order, but it's going to be really hard for yourself to navigate around and find tasks that have been set and for your pupils to navigate around and find stuff. So if I stress anything today, use topics because it makes it a lot easier. So as you can see here, it's all nice and ordered, all the work under the different topics. And you could have week one, term one, it's up to you. To make a topic, you click on this big create button. This is where we're going to do everything on this platform. And right down at the bottom, you've got a topic option. So I'm going to type uh, Pubble because we're going to be doing some Pubble 365 work today. And that's going to make my topic appear. Now, like anything on this platform, chronological order that comes up to the top. So it's going to be the top on my classwork and it's also going to be the top on the people's classwork. However, if I knew we were going down to the ICT suite for an afternoon and I wanted him to find a load of stuff in the Romans, I could click on my topic and I could move this up to the top. OK, I quite like that tool. They're all navigating around. So if you had a session where you were just going right today, it's all topic based. Move that topic right up to the top. It's the first thing the children will see when they log on. It's easier for them to access the work. OK, the same. They can all be edited. They can be deleted. They can be moved up and moved down, which is quite nice. So. We've made our topic of Pubble 365, so now we are going to put some work into that today. So we're going to go back to this Create button. Now, with regards to setting work, there's like four different options, and then there's this Reuse, which is really valuable. So I'm going to give you a quick tour on all of these, okay, and show you what you can do with all of them. And then obviously it's up to you guys to go away and have a play with it. So <clears throat> the one that you're going to use the most is this assignment. And what it does is it turns this page into this menu that pops up now. Now, this menu looks a bit daunting the first time you use it, but once you get your head around it, it's the same platform for each and every task that you set. So you kind of do get used to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to set a Pubble uh, 365 writing task today. So you have to give your piece of work a title. <clears throat> you then have the options for instructions. So in here, it's where you could put things like your learning objective. You could put in your success criteria. You could put in your grouping. You can put in anything you want there. OK, again, if you're working remotely, you might want to put more. But if you're in class, it could just be that you put your LO associated with it so that when you have scrutiny, they know what the point of the task was. Now then underneath it, you have two buttons here. OK, you've got your add button, which means you can add anything to this piece of work. So you've got the option of your Google Drive. Now, Google Drive, I'm not going to talk about too much today. It's something for the future. But basically, because we're working online, any piece of work that we associate with this classroom goes online and gets stored online. So you have a Google Drive for your classroom. So it's where you can quickly access files. It's like files stored on your computer, but this is all done through the browser through the Internet. You have the option to upload links. So say if I was doing, um, say for this writing task, I might send a link to a good page with a load of adjectives, or I might send a link to a thesaurus. If I wanted them to upskill their work, I might have a thesaurus. They could quickly find that on the iPads whilst they're working. Um, YouTube videos, if I was doing maths explanations, I might find a good video that I could just add alongside it. And then what you're probably going to do is this file. Now, this file gives you the option to upload anything that's been done. So I'm going to go into upload. And I'm going to then browse my computer. Now, what I'm going to show you here is probably what your teachers are going to do or what yourself might do, but you really need to think about this. What I've just done is I've gone right, we're doing some Pobble work. I've done a worksheet for my children to complete, and nine times out of ten, uh, uh, your teachers will be working on Word. So I've just uploaded a Word document. OK, now I apologise for the next couple of minutes because this is where I might lose you and confuse you, but please try and stick with it. I just want to point out the downsides of doing stuff in Word. Now, obviously, what we're using today is Google a Google Classroom, and it is all on the G Suite. Google and Microsoft are in direct competition to each other, so they're not going to want you to use cross platform. They're even Microsoft are going to want you to use Teams and Word and all that kind of stuff. And Google are going to want you to use the G Suite and Classroom and all of that. So. I have uploaded a worksheet on Word, but what I'm going to say to you that you may want to think about is starting to work. If you do go down the Google Classroom route, starting to work on G Suite. I worked in a school where we started using it and then we quick, soon quickly converted over to Google. I'm not saying you have to convert, but I'm saying there's some downsides to using Word. In comparison, what you're going to want to do is press this Create button. Now, when you have access to Google Classroom, you also have access to the whole G Suite. So that means you've got Docs, which is Word, you've got Slides, which is PowerPoint, you've got Sheets, which is Excel. Okay, and you've got Drawings and Forms as well at the bottom. 
What I would suggest to you to do is to go onto Docs. So I'm setting some work for my children to do. I'm going to create a new Google Docs. Now on this Google Docs, the simplest form, the simplest thing you can do as a teacher is find your worksheet that you're wanting to set and copy and paste it. OK, so what I'm just going to do really quickly is copy and paste the same document. Let me find a picture that was on the other document and uh, copy and paste this into here so it's good to go. Now, that's what I would suggest for your teachers to do in the interim until they kind of get their head around it. You can upload Word documents and convert them in Google Drive, um, but it's a little bit more confusing. So what I've done on here is I've just copy and pasted. I say that if my uh, if it wants to actually paste an image, that would be good. Um, so I've just made a worksheet. So this is going to look the same as my Word worksheet. I've just copied it, pasted it, and I've got it good to go. OK, I could totally label that up here. But I'm just going to leave it untitled for the moment. I'm just going to close it. Now, I'll come back to those in a minute. I just want to show you the comparison between Word and Google Docs so you know, because what I don't need to do is walk out of this session today or this training going, yeah, Google Classroom is amazing. Start uploading work in Word and then finding that your children can't actually complete it. So I just want to show you the downfalls almost so you know what you've got to work around. Now, those two worksheets are uploaded. We'll come back to them shortly. What you do need to do before you set them is on the right hand side here, it gives you an option of what you want the students to be able to do with this. So automatically it says that you just want the students to view it. Now that then is just like a PDF. It just means they'll be able to see that document, but not do anything with it. Um, still relevant to be fair, the way in which I used to work in my classroom was just on save and photocopying. If you've got iPads, you can upload some of your worksheets onto Google Classroom. The children can look at them that way rather than printing them. So if you just want them to see them, you can. The other two options probably are more purposeful though. So the second one is students can edit a file. Now, what we mean by edit is that we're sending one file out to all 30 pupils and they are all working collaboratively on it. So it takes a bit of structure and a bit of thinking about the way in which you want this in your classroom, but it is quite powerful. So I used to do one Google Sheets when we were doing data collection and then I'd have all of my children populating the data, their frequency charts just all together. The same as when I used to do uh, English vocab, I might upload one table which says adjectives, adverbs, uh, personification, metaphors, and we would all populate one table and then we've got it on the board that we work on in our work. OK, or lastly, like when we used to do research, if I was doing the Roman topic, I'd make one PowerPoint or one slides presentation. Page one would say Roman food, page two would say Roman clothes, page three would say Roman houses. We'd go to the ICT suite and I would give groups a page to populate. And then I mean, at the end of the lesson, I haven't got to scroll through 30 PowerPoints and collate them. I've just got one PowerPoint and everyone's been working on one slide within it. OK, so edit is really valuable, but probably what you're going to want to do is just make a copy for each student. This then means it's like going down to the photocopier and photocopying a sheet for everyone. They all have their own worksheet to complete and submit back to you. OK, so I've got my worksheet uploaded. I've made sure that everyone's got a copy on the right hand side. I'll talk you through some of these options. And like I say, once you get your head around these, these are the same for every piece of work that you set. So at the top here, I've got who I can set it for. So like I say, if you're associated with more than one class, you can set it to more than one class. So if I was doing the English planning for the week, I might set it for both year five classes. However, like I pointed out earlier, as soon as you choose more than one class, the option to remove students kind of disappears. So because in my class, I've got a few students with SEN needs. I'm going to make sure that it's just my class clicked and then I'm going to unclick these two because they won't be able to access this. So it's quite nice. You can drill down into students and say who you want to receive the work and who you don't. The next tier is this points. I don't really see the point of it. Um, I personally, you can say so if you set it as 100, it gives you the option to label to mark. So you can mark it out of 60, 70. Might work if you wanted to upload a success criteria. So they got 10 points for each thing on their success criteria if you're done a hot right. But I normally just turn it to ungraded. When it's ungraded, it then has a nice tick they've completed or no, they haven't. If you want to look at it as that class mark book kind of thing at the grades at the top. You got the option for due date. I don't use this for in-house work, but if I was setting homework, I'd give, put a due date on it. It means when the children log on, on the left hand side, they have a little calendar view, so it tells them what's due. Um, so I normally set a due date for homework just so they can see that coming. But for stuff that I'm doing in school, I wouldn't bother. And then lastly, quite important, you've got your topic. So we made our Pubble 365 topic earlier, so I'm just going to choose that. But equally, if I forgot to make a topic, I could create one there and then. 
Okay. And then lastly at the bottom, you've got a rubric. Again, I'm not going to delve into that too much today, but if you were doing hot rights or you wanted to tick against KPIs, if there was evidence collection and certain things like that, you could upload a rubric. You could upload a success criteria as a rubric and then you could have the mark and edit against that if you wanted to. So my work is good to go. My instructions are there. I've got a copy for each child. I'm now going to go to the top and where it says assign, there's a little arrow which I just want to point out to you guys. This means you can either assign it live now, you can schedule it or you can save it as a draft. So again, scheduling uh, in the realms where people were working remotely and sending work home when schools weren't in the classroom, that was quite relevant because they could schedule work to go live on certain days. Again, you might want to schedule your homework or tasks if you want to, but I am just going to assign this so it's going to go out live now. OK, that's going to get sent on the stream to every class. And what it's also going to do is it's going to go into my classwork and it's going to appear here under my Pobble 365 heading. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take you back to a pupil view. So I'm going to kind of give you a 360 view, I guess, of what it looks like from teacher setting work to pupils doing the work and then teacher marking the work. So you can get a few, full view of it today. Now, refreshing my stream from my child demo account, what you'll see is that appears right up at the top, which is really nice. OK, your child can go to classwork up here. And again, this looks exactly the same as the teacher. So you've got Pobble 365 here. Um, but I quite like the fact that it comes up into their stream at the top. So they're going to click on this and it takes them to this page. This page is the get again, it's the same view that a pupil will get for any piece of work that has been set. So the first time they use it, it looks a bit daunting, but as they get used to it, they kind of figure out what it means. You've got your title here and your instructions. Then you'll see I've got two options for comments because I've allowed my class comments on. So this class comment, if they were to type something in here, would go out to every pupil. Uh, it's not a bad thing. You could say to the pupils, write your best sentence in here or share some vocab or share some ideas. They've got that option to collaborate on this piece of work if they want to. If they were doing a research based topic and they found a really good website, they could put it in there and share it with everyone else. What they've also got is they've got the option to put on personal private comments. So if they were really stuck with something and they wanted to ask your help, but they didn't want everyone else the class to see it, they could put that there, which is quite nice. OK, we did have one school say that they didn't want any uh, direct messaging between pupils and can we turn that off? The answer, unfortunately, for this is you cannot turn off this private comment, but you don't have to respond to it, obviously. So it doesn't really open up a channel. You just don't have to respond. Now, on the right hand side here, you'll see I've got the work. And again, this is where I'm just going to point out that Word v Google kind of thing for you. Um, so I'm going to open up this Word document first so you can see that what pupils are going to see. And I just want to point this out because most teachers work in Word. Most teachers will pick up Google Classroom and they'll upload Word documents and you're going to be faced with a few barriers if you choose to do that. Because what you'll see here is I've got my document, but I can't click on it. It's just a viewer. The reason for that is Google doesn't know if you have a Microsoft license. It doesn't know if you have access to Word. It doesn't know anything about that. So it can't really grant you access to a platform that isn't its own. What you can do, however, is at the top, if I hover over, you'll see here it says open with Google Docs. If I choose to click that, what it's now doing is it's taking that Word document that had been set. It's converting it all over to Google and it's making a new document that the children can then open and they can then work on. So the answer so with some people ask us is can you do art work on word well yeah you can but you've got to convert it so this would be my story starter and they might type a response on here now what you've got to think about though and this is the one headache which is where again probably a headache for teachers let alone pupils is i've now just done my task but i haven't done it on the original document i've done it on this converted document here okay so a child is probably going to close that close this and think they've done the work if they send that document back to you, there is nothing on it because we could not work on that. What the child would have to do, they'd have to go to add or create. They'd have to go to their Google Drive, which is where I've just converted that document. And in my recent, you'll see here this converted one, they would have to then choose that and re-upload it. Now, I've probably lost half, lost half of you as teachers, let alone as pupils. So if you're doing Word on a Word document, they cannot access that document. They can't edit it. They can't send it back to you. They're having to convert and through converting, they're making a new document, which they probably won't be aware of. OK, in comparison, if I click on my Google Docs version, which was a copy and paste job of my Word document because I still work in Word, um, you'll see that it opens straight away. It is here. It is good to go and it is all ready. So in comparison, you can see the difference. I would 
try and get your teachers into the habit of working on a Google document um, and making sure that it is good to go like this. OK, now this goes live. It's all saved on the drive. It's all on the Internet. I don't need to do anything. I close it and I can submit that. OK, so those are the two things. Word, bit of a barrier because it's going to open up and they won't be able to do anything on it. They're going to have to convert it. And then if converting it, they're going to have to realise that they've got to send that converted document back. If you can avoid using Word, please do copy and paste it onto a Google Docs. It's so much smoother. Before I turn that in and submit it back to the teacher, I just want to point out one other thing. So obviously a lot of the tasks that some teachers do is this worksheet based. So it's like a maths worksheet or an English worksheet. Off you go there, you go and do it. I just want to point out that on the bottom of every assignment, you have this add or create button. And this add or create button means that children can literally send you anything back. OK, they have a Google Drive, which means any work they have done previously gets stored on there. They can send you a link to a web page. They can send you a file and by file. It means they can upload a PowerPoint, a Word document, an Excel. They can upload anything. If they're working on a tablet, they could upload an iMovie. They could upload a stop motion animation, a video of themselves explaining something. They also have the G Suite attached to it. So they can make a Google Docs here and now or a slides or a sheets or a drawing even. So please do think about this when you're setting your work. If you're getting into the way of using Google Classroom, don't feel like you've got to do those closed tasks all the time because as a teacher, I wouldn't do a worksheet based task every lesson. It would be boring. I'd do some open ended research based stuff. And this add or create button allows you to do some open ended stuff and show get the children to show you what they can create and send it back in. So anyway, my work is finished. I'm going to turn it in. OK, I'm now going to take you back to my teacher view. And again, the one downside with Google Classroom, if I load my teacher view, is that unfortunately you don't get any notifications saying that work's been submitted. If you keep your emails on, you do. But again, I'm not really going to want 30 emails. So what you have to do is you have to go back to that task. So now if I click on my Pubble 365 task that we've just set, you can see that someone has turned it in. OK. Now, if I click on that one turned in, I then get a list of everyone so I can see who's done it and who hasn't and what they need to work on. So here, these people are yet to submit it. This one is turned in and you can even see the private comment there that she said she needed help. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to take you full circle. So I'm just going to show you if you want to then see the work that they've done, you can click on the attachments. And this is then when you can offer feedback and marking. Again, look at how you can do it. Think about your feedback and marking policy that you already have in a school, because again, in my opinion, it's more secondary based than primary, but you do have the option. So if I just take you back really quickly to that Word document, again, this Word document is pointless because I can't upload it. I can't do anything. It's just going to come as a viewer file. And if the child converted that document and thinks they've sent it back to you, they haven't. They've just got the original. Uh, in comparison, if I go to my Google Docs document here, it loads up straight away. It's there. It's good to go. OK, now what you can do then is you can highlight stuff and you can start to add comments. So I might add a comment bank saying capital letter, uh, which was needed here. Um, I can add just general comments like feedback so I can add a well well done or I can add a next steps. Um, you can start to leave feedback in that way if you would like to. I also have the option here to add a private comment. So if I wanted to support them a little bit further or get them to try something extra, I could put that in here. And lastly, just to point out, which is quite useful, is you can add a comment bank. So what you can do on here, this is like your generalised copy and paste. If I found actually that everyone had really, really had rubbish uh, conjunctions, I could do a next step of conjunctions. I could type my sentence saying, if I could spell. Um, I could type my sentence saying that I want everyone to try and use although within their thing and then I could add that. And what these comment banks are is it's just like a copy and paste job so I can copy it to clipboard and then I can paste it quite easily. So Google does open up their rooms for feedback. Again, think about your school, think about your accessibility of your pupils. There's no point doing feedback if you're not going to give children the time to actually act upon it, but there is the option to do that there. So and again, they can reply to comments as well, so they could say what they want to do in their next steps. So I can send that back if I want to and I can return it to the pupil. That means the child will get it back. They've got something to work on. Um, if you do choose to send it back, one thing just to make you aware of <clears throat> again, which is a downside is that it doesn't really come up to the people saying you've got a, it doesn't unfortunately give them a notification saying Miss Vindler submitted some work back. So the best thing that I could do, it tells you that it's returned here. Um, I would go back to your instructions of this task and what I used to do is I used to just put marked so the pupils could see that comment and have a look. Again, it depends how you're using Google Classroom, because if I was doing this in an English lesson, I'd say log on, have a look at your feedback before you move on to the next piece of work. Um, but just to let you know.
So that is, if we go back to classwork, that is your assignment. So that is how you're going to set any work that way. Remembering that you can do your closed kind of worksheets where you've got to just remember to change it to make a copy for each pupil. Or you can have those open ended tasks because on an assignment, the child can literally submit to you anything. So again, it's great for evidence collection. If I'm thinking with my computing head on now, if I was doing a stop motion animation unit in computing, um, I could set an assignment as an open ended assignment, just saying upload your thing, upload your creation and the children could then upload their file, which means then you've on your classroom got a log of all of those all of those pieces of work and it doesn't get lost. OK, so it is another good way, especially if you're working on iPads quite heavily of making sure that the online content that you make doesn't get lost. It gets kept in a platform. I'm going to talk through some of the different options of things you can submit though. So the next one I'm going to do is a quiz. So I'm going to scroll down and just show you a couple of different quizzes. The way in which I'd use them is a uh, SPAG would be one of the options. So I've just created a draft on here of a SPAG quiz and all I've done here is taken the key stage two uh, SATS paper and put it onto a SPAG check. Um, this is brilliant because you can have multiple choice, you can have fill in the blanks, you can have rewrite your answer. And to be honest, I wish I'd done this whilst I was teaching because what you can do with the quizzes is you can have them self marking. So where I had to mark pages and pages of SPAG tests, this would save me loads of time. OK, now obviously not every question is self marking because here I'm going to want to have to check have they written this as a command, but just to save me marking five out of six questions would be amazing. Uh, some of the other ways in which you can use quizzes that we've done is reading comprehension. So this is one of our reading comprehension groups. This is just an example of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <clears throat> so post chapter one, here's a quiz one to do. What I really like about this, certainly if I'm thinking with my upper key stage two head on, is that throw these quizzes back to your pupils. So you have the access as a teacher to create a quiz, but children as part of the G Suite also have the option to make a Google form and a quiz as well. So actually for your inference and for your embedded learning and actually that greater depth, can you ask the children to create a quiz on what they have just read? So rather than you can flip guided reading really on its head and ask the pupils to make them for their peers, which is brilliant. The other way in which I'd make a quiz would probably be for maths. So I'm just going to show you now so you can see that actually a lot of people go, oh my God, Google Forms, it's going to take me hours. It does not have to. So I'm going to quick click on that quiz assignment. I'm going to do one for place value today. Uh, so again, I could put my instructions and my LO in here if I wanted to. Uh, and what you'll see down here is it's already created a blank quiz for you. Now, there's no reason why you can't add extra stuff on here. So if it's the first time doing place value, I might want to link a YouTube video which had a really good explanation and I might want to upload a worksheet for them to complete afterwards. OK, it doesn't have to be solely a quiz. You can upload different things. But what you'll see now is if I click on this quiz, it's got a blank template for me. You can change this, you can make it pretty, you can change colours, you've got your colour pad up the top, you can uh, preview what it's going to look like. You know, you've got loads of different things you can do on here. So the children, again, if you're having it as a unit, could really play around with it. But I'm just going to show you really quickly what to do. So here I cannot type today. Here I've got my title. I can add a YouTube video if I want an explanation. I can add a photo. I can change the text and descriptions and things there, but we're going to do basics. So I'm going to do 56 add 10. Now what you notice if you saw it really quickly there is on the right hand side, the computer's tried to guess what kind of answer you're going to be expecting. So on here, you've got loads of different options, whether you want a short answer, a paragraph, multiple choice or check boxes, you can change this to whatever you want. OK, but we want them to answer with an answer. So we've got a short answer. Now I can leave my quiz like this, but I'm really lazy. And I don't want to mark my quiz. So at the bottom here, I've got an answer key. If I click on here, it gives me the option to put in the correct answer. OK, so it works really well for maths because obviously it's going to be case sensitive. If you were doing it for English, it might be a bit harder. But here <clears throat> I'm going to put in 66 and everything else is going to be incorrect. OK, you can even then add some feedback if you want. So you could have a little model or a little picture of how you're going to move place value if you wanted to do that. And I'm just going to press done. OK, so I'll show you that again. So to make a new question, you're going to press the plus button. I'm going to do 48 and I'm going to subtract 10 this time. Uh, if it hasn't changed from multiple choice, I'm going to click here because I'm going to want them to answer. So I'm going to put in a short answer and then I could leave it like that, but I don't want to mark it. So I'm going to go to the answer key. The correct answer is going to be 38 and everything else is going to be wrong. OK, and as quickly as that, I've made a quiz. 
So I can do it that quick, the pupils could also do it like that. And this then could be your AFL. So it could be a pre and post task. We could put this out at the start of my unit, at the end of my unit, the same questions. We've got a nice assessment. Uh, we used to use this in year four when the times table test went to be online. We made times table quizzes and we just used to push it out every week and it was timed. So see how far they could get. You can have quizzes for anything, but maths lends itself really well. You can even snip it, white rose pictures and put them on here if you want to, because for each one I can upload the image. OK, so that's my quiz. Good to go. I'm going to set it for everyone. I don't want any points. Uh, I don't want a due date, but I'm going to put that into my maths unit there. OK, and then I'm going to assign it. Now, what I'm going to do really quickly <clears throat> once that's been assigned is I'm going to take you to back to my pupil view so you can kind of see what the child's going to see. So if the child goes back to their class view, their stream, <clears throat> it should come up at the top saying that Ms. Finn has set a new task. So there's my place value. If I click on that, you get the same view. They kind of get used to this view. You've got class comment, you've got private comment. What I quite like on here as well is they still got that add and create button because it was an assignment essentially. So if they did really shocking on their place value quiz, if it was homework, they might go and do some extra research and submit something in. But I'm going to show you what it looks like just to complete a quiz. So the child gets the form like this. I'm going to put in 66 and I'm also going to put in 40 uh, and I'm going to submit that. OK, that goes off to the teacher. The teacher sees everyone's <coughs> everyone's uh, answers. But what the child can do is they can go and view their score, which I think is quite nice. So the child can see what they got right, see what they got wrong, see what they need to work on. OK, so quizzes are great. And as you can see there, hopefully not that hard to do. OK, it doesn't take long to kind of create a quiz for the child to do. Right. Last one then that I'll probably show you is this question. OK, so your assignments is those open ended, closed ended tasks. Here's a worksheet to do or I want you to submit something. Quizzes, great for SPAG, guided reading, maths. And then you've got this option of a question. And this is, does exactly what it says. It is just asking the children one question. It's like a quiz, but only the first one. And it gives you the option that either you want a short answer or a multiple choice. So if you click multiple choice, it gives you the option to add different options. So you could do this for voting do it for just uh, next steps with regards to science lessons if you just wanted a, a view a pre and post task of what they were thinking um, I quite used to like doing it for science where I would upload an image um, and like so concept cartoons for argument's sake I used to love using in science so I'd upload the concept cartoon and I'd have the question is who do you agree with and why <laughs> Okay, and then I would then I've got a quick overview of where actually their 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 thinking is before we started the subject. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you one other way that I quite like using it. So can he give me an adjective? So I quite like having questions as part of my starter. So what I've uploaded here is imagine we were still doing that Pubble 365 task and my task today was to get them to do a story starter. Well, I'm not going to get them to do a story starter unless we've done some work on it prior. So what I used to do was, again, Monday morning task, I'd log on to Google Classroom and I'd, uh, I'd schedule like five or six questions to go live. So I might go, can you give me an adjective? Can you give me an adverb? Can you give me some personification? Can you give me uh, a, like, so, uh, I can't think. Can you give me a metaphor? Can you give me a simile? That kind of stuff. I'd ask five or six questions. I'd upload the picture for each question so they can log onto their iPad. They can zoom in on the picture if they want to. And I would just set it as one of my tasks. So this is going to go into Pubble. OK, now the thing with questions that I really like, and this is one thing to be aware with when you set questions, when you set a Google form, a bit like our maths quiz, the children answer and they answer anonymously. OK, when you set a question like this as an open ended question, everyone can see everyone's answers. So just be aware if you're doing a pre and post task and you know some children aren't going to be doing very well, you might want to not set it as a question because everyone will be able to see what they put. But here I've just got my Pubble 365, so I'm going to have a look at this image. Um, I've uploaded the Word document rather than the image. And then in here, I'm going to type in an answer. Really rubbish adjective, scary. Once I've submitted that, they then get the option, which is what I really like for collaboration, is to see classmates' answers. They can see them here or here. And what this then starts to build up is that you imagine every child has got these five questions to answer at the start of your English. It's the equivalent of having loads of post-it notes on bits of paper. This would then be populated with 30 different adjectives, which you could pull into your lesson. You could talk about which ones are most powerful, which ones weren't, which ones we're going to use, how would we model some structures, sentences around them. So it's really, really good for collaboration and sharing ideas as a 
class. And you imagine you knew that five questions at the start for adjectives, personification, metaphors, similes. The children have then got their iPads on the table where they can draw back into all this language that's been developed and used it in their writing. So I really like questions like that. Again, either for next steps or for pre and post tasks, concept cartoons for science are really good, but I'm sure you can think of a million other ideas. But the question tool I really like. Um, the last thing then I'll just show you really briefly, not that I massively use this one, is you have got the option to do material. Now, material is just a one way thing. So say I was doing a new topic and I was doing the Romans, uh, I might just set some things for them to look at. And what you can do on material, again, is you can add anything. So we could add a link to a website, we could upload a file if we've got a text piece we want them to read, or we can even go into YouTube and Google syncs with YouTube like this. So it's all live. So if we're searching Romans, we can see what we get. Day in the life of the Roman soldier. Let's add that. Let's add this to our topic. You'll see that there's no due date. There's no grading because we're not asking the children to do anything. We are merely just submitting some things for them to look at. So again, if you've got guided reading and you want them to read an extract, upload it as a material because when the child logs on, I'll go back to the child view really quickly. Uh, they'll see this material and they won't have to do anything with it. They don't have to assign anything. So material is just that one way. Have a look at this. Again, I don't use it massively because I'd probably set stuff as assignments if I wanted them to complete something. So that's pretty much all of your different options that you've got here. Your assignments is that open ended task of upload and send me something back or those worksheets. And remember, click make a copy for each pupil that you can ask them to set. Your quizzes are great for SPAG, guided reading. Um, again, remember, throw it back to the children and ask the children to create some quizzes because it's really going to show them and make them think about their application in greater depth. And um, maths, brilliant. Get them self marking so you haven't got to do it. And questions, again, great for gathering vocab or just to kind of see where they are at the end of a unit, throw out a question, see what they're thinking. <laughs> now, the last thing before I kind of finish talking uh, on the session is this reuse post, which is possibly the most valuable thing they've got on here. If you click on reuse post, what it does is it takes you to any piece of work that you've done throughout the year on this class. And also then what you can have a think of is you can have your archive classes. So if you're using Google Classroom year on year, if you've done the work and made it for last year, don't do it again. Just put it back in because if you go back, you can see all the classes that you're associated with. So say for argument's sake, my other year five teacher, Joe, has done all the maths work. I can literally just click on this post, go create a new copy and just reuse it. That saves him emailing me the worksheet, that saves me trawling through Google, Google Drive or the server to find the sheet that he's done. It pulls up the task he's done with the title, with the form, with the right topic and everything else here and the instructions. And all I've got to do is put, click assign. So if you're working in a two or three form entry school, it is amazing for saving you time. Someone can do English, someone could do maths and you haven't got to send it to each other or re-upload it. You just go to reuse and you pull in what they've already done. That's why I cannot stress at the beginning <clears throat> that I said to you is associate yourself with all of the classes in your year group. Turn off the notifications so you don't get bothered by them, but make sure you're there with them. The other way in which I use it again, if you think back to our first task that we did, we did this Pubble 365 writing task, but I missed off two pupils who had SEN needs. Now, again, rather than me doing all the faff of typing it up again, putting the title in, putting the success criteria and the instructions, I can click on that initial task and click reuse. It's going to pull up the task that we did earlier and everything is there good to go. The title, the instructions, the fact that it's ungraded, the topic, it's all there good to go. So now, I can just click those two pupils who had SEN needs that we missed and I can either create a new document for them or I can dig into the document that we've already done and add some scaffolded prompts or copy and paste some different work. So it's a really nice way to reuse even tasks that you've already done to then manipulate, change them and then set them out for pupils. So that reuse post is going to save teachers loads of time in sharing good practice that you've already done. So. I'm pretty much done. That is a whistle stop tour of how to set loads of different classwork. Before I finish, there's one more thing that I just want to point out, which I said I'd come back to at the end, and that's this meet link. So again, when we've been setting this up with the DFE, it's something that we're told to kind of talk to you about. And again, I don't think it's necessarily relevant now. It was quite prominent in the way in which when schools went into lockdown and schools are having to work remotely, and who knows if that's going to happen again. Um, but it meant that when schools went into lockdown, they were trying to send out email invites to parents or Teams groups or Google Meets every day or Zoom or things like that. 
this Google Meet with every classroom, you have a Google Meet link there. And as you can see, I've just turned off the visibility. So if I want that visible to pupils, I can make that visible in my settings here and save it. Um, so if you did work in a remote world again, we could turn that off. You can also have it turned off so the pupils can't see it. What it means is anyone within this class can click on that link and they can go live into there. So it's really nice for if you have are doing interventions or you're working remotely, you haven't got to send out a million different invites to different children. You just post an announcement with a timetable. You can even post an announcement to just a handful of students going that we're doing a maths intervention at 2 p.m. The children click on that link at 2 p.m. and you are then at home live ready to go. OK, the link doesn't go live until uh, a teacher clicks on it. So even if it is visible, please don't think, oh, my God, my children could be having a chat at home in the middle of the night. They can't. They need a teacher or a staff member, a teacher present for it to be activated. But it's a really good way if you are going to be working remotely again. OK, there's no reason you couldn't have if a child is missing out on school trip. They could access the meet link in and your teacher could be on the meet link on your phone, showing them the school trip for argument's sake. Um, but again, if you are using that, please use it in line with your um, safeguarding policy. Like I say, best practice is you shouldn't have one member of staff in there. You should always have more than one member of staff. The reason I say that, especially with Google Meet Link, is that if your internet crashed and you were to leave that Meet Link, the children don't get kicked out. They remain in there. So imagine your internet crashed. You've then got 30 people chatting on that link on their own unsupervised and it doesn't end just because you're not in there. So there's obviously things to think about if you are using that. But that's just the last thing I wanted to point out. Again, might not be so prominent now, but if we do work remotely again, you've got that rather than having the faff of having to set up all of your links. So that is pretty much a whistle stop tour of this classroom. OK, and hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into a few of the setting things just to be aware of and certainly how to set work and what it kind of looks like from a teacher and a pupil perspective. And like I said, videos like this and a lot of our short snippet videos will be on our ARC ICT YouTube page so please do have a look at that if you want some more information and post this session today live on Teams the link will still be active so you can re-watch this because I know that I've gone through quite a lot, a lot in a short space of time. Um, Hopefully you found that useful. Thank you for coming today. What I will say now is I'm going to end this live session, but our team are going to stay behind the scenes and uh, answer any Q&A. So if you've got any questions about how to set it up or anything from this, please don't think that we're just going to walk away now. We'll stay here for another five or ten minutes and we'll answer some of those questions for you. Um, so if you have got anything else, please do put that in the chat and we will try and answer it. But hopefully that's actually given you a little bit of an insight into what you can do, the potential. And like I say, we'll run more sessions in the future, delving into more of them in more depth.